Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number six in this Bible study series on prayer. This is a topical Bible study, so we are moving around from one place to another in Scripture from one week to the next. Uh, you will need your Bible open to uh, Luke chapter 18, or your Bible app will do just fine. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 out of Luke chapter 18 today. Uh, you will also want the listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Scroll down and click on that link download that PDF and then print it out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and then there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through afterwards. So before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray together, shall we? We look around us, Lord, and uh, it's troubling uh, all of the uh, struggles and the conflicts and the difficulties that we see all around us or maybe that we're going through ourselves. And uh, as Christ followers, Father, you've given us a vehicle to, uh, to deal with those difficulties through prayer. You've taught us, Lord, that uh, you want us to bring these things to you and that you want to use this time with you to change us, to to shape us, to form us into the people you've called us to be. And so that becomes our request even today, Lord. Our request is that you would teach us about prayer, teach us to pray, and that you would use uh, times like this to do that very work on us. Change how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us, how we see you and understand you. In short, Father, as we open your word today, will you open our hearts and our minds and will you change us as only you can? That is our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer as a central discipline to following Jesus. That's what we're talking about each week. We're asking the same couple of questions with each of these lessons. Number one, what does this passage teach me about prayer? And number two, how does this passage cause me to pray? That's a super important question, a really practical question. How does this actually move me, move me to pray? Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about wordless prayers and shameless prayers. Wordless prayers, that is, depending upon the work of the Holy Spirit in us to take prayers to the, to the Father in heaven that we don't have words for or that we don't even know to be praying for. And then last week, we talked about shameless prayer, looked at... Uh, uh, one of the uh, out of the Gospel of Luke, one of the uh, parables that Jesus told about God just wants us to quit trying to parse words, tr tr quit trying to find all the the right fancy ways of saying things, and just bring our hearts before Him shamelessly, uh, and 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 stand before Him and and talk with Him that way. Now, this week we're going to be talking about uh, a similar concept to last week. It's uh, but I would call this week focused more on persistence in our prayer. Uh, again, we're going to be looking at another parable of Jesus. Uh, remaining hopeful, never losing heart, continuing to come back to the Lord over and over and over again. We are still in Luke's gospel, just like we were last week. We said last week that uh, we reminded ourselves that Luke uh, is a historian. He was not an eyewitness to these events, and so he didn't actually sit at Jesus' feet and hear Jesus tell this parable, but, but in his research, uh, for his first volume, uh, which we would call the Gospel of Luke, he, he learned of all these things that Jesus taught. Uh, and his Gospel uh, seems to be aimed predominantly at the Greek culture. Uh, Matthew aimed at the Jewish culture. Mark aimed at the Roman culture. Uh, Luke's Gospel seems to be aimed predominantly at the Greek culture. And he has, interestingly, more emphasis than Matthew or Mark on some of the outcasts. He has more emphasis on women, more interest, e emphasis on Gentiles and Samaritans uh, he, than these other Gospels do. And uh, that's an interesting, an interesting thing. Perhaps it's because we believe that much of the information that Luke got, he, we believe he got from Jesus' mother, Mary. That may well explain some of that. We don't know, but uh, it's true that, uh, that the emphasis is there. Uh, Luke's Gospel also has far more in it about prayer than the other synoptic Gospels, than Matthew or Mark's Gospels have in them. And this lesson uh, is another unique parable, uh, a parable that Jesus told about prayer that is unique to Luke's Gospel. Matthew and Mark do not include it. Uh, 
Luke leaned heavily on the parables. He included more than any of the other gospels. Um, and, and of the many, many parables that Jesus told, Luke by far has the most of them included in his gospel. And, and more than a dozen of the parables that Luke talks about are in fact unique to his gospel or not included in the other gospels, including the one from today. Today's lesson on prayer apparently, and we don't know this for sure because it's not always clear um, the, the timeline when we're reading uh, Luke's gospel, it's not always clear whether, whether verses 1 through 8 of chapter 18 followed immediately behind uh, the end of chapter 17, but it appears that that could be the case. And in chapter 17 of Luke's gospel, uh, Luke was talking about some really difficult, uh, difficult uh, things. Uh, uh, Jesus had some difficult teaching on his return uh, on end times, on eschatology, on uh, things that were no doubt very difficult for the disciples to grasp. And so the flow of thought, uh, if, if these ch two chapters really are backed up right next to each other in a timeline, the flow of thought seems to be from this very distressing topic of, oh no, that seems really difficult to discern truth in, in the middle of all of that kind of stuff that's going to be going on to the importance of prayer and never losing heart. And so that's what today's parable beginning in verse 1 of chapter 18 is all about. Here's what it sounds like. Uh, let me just read. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So Luke tells us the point of the parable even before he gets into the parable. Look at it again. That they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's the reason. Now, we don't always get that, but that's the reason, in this case, Luke gives it to us right up front. This is the reason Jesus told this parable. Perhaps in order to encourage them after, again, that frankly difficult teaching that we see <laughs> in the latter half of chapter 17 on end times and how difficult that's going to be and how scary that's going to be. So we understand the point of the parable from the outset, but let's unpack the parable a little bit further. Like last week's parable about knocking on a neighbor's door in the middle of the night, uh, Jesus is not asking us to see this calloused, unrighteous judge as we see God. In fact, he's, he's intending just the opposite. He's, he's going to contrast this judge with God. We get the message twisted if we treat it that way. If, if, we, if we read this parable and think, if this is a parable about prayer and the widow, the persistent widow is the one praying and the judge is the one to whom she's praying, then does, is this telling us that God is rolling his eyes and, and frustrated with us and, oh no, here comes Blake again. I wish he'd leave me alone. No, that's not what that, that, that would be a completely wrong reading of this parable. What he's going to do instead is he's going to actually contrast God. Um, uh, rather, like last week, he's teaching here from lesser to greater, which again, we talked about this last week, but that was a, a very common teaching paradigm, a very common teaching vehicle for the rabbis of that time. If this is true of such a small thing, then imagine how much more true it would be in this case. And that's what he's doing here. If this is true of an unrighteous judge, listening to this woman's prayer, how much more true would it be of God who loves infinitely? That's where he's headed with this. So this judge is not an allegory for God hearing our prayers. Rather, he is representative of all that is broken with humanity. And still, even in the midst of that brokenness, even in his unrighteousness, even though he does not fear God, even though he does not respect man, even with all of that, he still chooses to administer justice. That's the point. So in line with the lesser to greater teaching here, it seems apparent that, that our sense of justice is also, just like this judge's 
reaction is lesser and God's is greater. Similarly, our entire sense of justice is lesser than God's sense of justice. And I think we have to bear that in mind. Anytime we start thinking or talking about justice in any regard is we have our sense of what would be fair, what would be right, what would be just. But just like any four-year-old child, we are inclined to say, but that's not fair. This is not fair. I want this. I think this would be more fair. Our sense of justice is extremely small and very childlike compared to God's sense of justice. And in our most self-righteous moments, I think we're capable of convincing ourselves that we kind of have a corner on the market of justice, that we understand, that I understand justice better than anyone else, and that our sense of justice is kind of the end all of the concept of justice, and that, as it turns out, is just foolishness on our part. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide about justice. Even a broken and flawed humanity has a sense of justice and tends to seek after it. But our understanding of justice is obviously and naturally embarrassingly small compared to God's sense of justice. We would do well to remember that. But let's get back to Jesus' main point of this parable. His main point of this parable is look at this woman and how she persisted in asking for justice, Uh, that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's what he's wanting to say here. And he says that this widow kept coming to this judge, kept coming to him over and over again. Even our secular culture would recognize the huge power imbalance between this widow and this judge, right? This widow in her culture, she had zero power. She wasn't even Uh, almost wasn't even considered a person. She certainly didn't have any rights as a citizen, as a woman and as a widow. She had no husband to advocate on her behalf. She had no sons to advocate, apparently, to advocate on her behalf. So she was it. She was the only one who could do this. So there was an enormous power imbalance. All the power, all of the authority in the way Jesus is telling this story, he intends this to be the case. All of the authority and the power lies with the judge None of it lies with her. The only power she has is to speak. That's really the only thing she's got going for her. The widow had nothing else to give. She had no hope, and she had no power, and she had no authority of any kind other than just to continue to come to this judge and ask for justice. And so she did. She continued. She persisted in the asking. Jesus' point here about hope seems to be a two-edged sword, seems to be double-edged. Number one, there is likewise a huge power imbalance between us and God, and we we should be careful not to miss that reality. We should be careful not to take that, uh, not to completely skip over that reality that there is an enormous power imbalance between us. But number two, all of our hope is in fact in God alone. All of this widow's hope was in this judge alone. All of our hope is in God alone, and our persistence should reflect that, that understanding. That's the point here, persistence. We talked last week about regular, habitual conversation with God. That's what Jesus was after, and, and that same thing is true in this parable as well. Um, the, 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 the New Testament writers, particularly the Apostle Paul, was all over this idea of constantly being in communication with God. Listen to some of the things that Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. He said, Always be joyful, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Never stop praying praying, he said, to the church in Colossa, uh, the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. He said, devote yourselves to prayer. We should devote ourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. And then in, the, in, the, in his letter to the Ephesians, to, to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So the Apostle Paul and the New Testament writers really picked up on this idea of persistence in prayer and being very regular, always coming before the Lord. It seems to me that Jesus is speaking here not only 
to the frequency with which we pray, but also to the hope that we must continue to hold on to as we pray. That's what we see in this widow. There are struggles and difficult circumstances in this life that often linger far longer than we want them to or than we think they should be. And like Job in Old Testament, we pray and we pray and those circumstances just continue to linger and continue to plague us. This word is an encouraging word from Jesus that even under those circumstances, we must never lose hope and we must never stop praying. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the the next statement on your listening guide. Prayer is a discipline that teaches us to never lose hope. The more we do it, the more hope we have. With prayer, persistence and hope go hand in hand. They both feed off of each other. So Jesus' intention seems to be then to contrast, as we've talked about the persistence of the widow, now let's look at the judge. His, his, his intention seems to be to contrast this judge with God. Whereas the unrighteous judge tarries, right? He takes his time, he piddles around, he, doesn't, he, he makes her continue to come over and over and over again, and he really doesn't want to have to deal with her. Jesus wants us to see if that's true of an unrighteous person and he eventually gets to justice, he begins to come, come to the conclusion that he needs to administer justice, how much more so would God do it and how much more quickly would God jump, come to that conclusion? Look what he says in verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give, them just, he will give justice to them speedily. So again, this is that idea from lesser to greater. If this is the way a broken judge does it, think about how much more so God would do it. But look what he says. He says, hear what the unrighteous judge says says. I want you to note something here. This is something that's interesting to me. Jesus doesn't actually finish the parable with any actions on the judge's part. He he ends the parable with the moment that the judge makes the decision in his head of what he's going to do. But then he doesn't go on in the story to, to say that the judge then issued this ruling and actually administered justice and actually made it all come about. The the parable ends with the decision in the judge's mind. I think that's interesting. Uh, The judge lingers long and then he says to himself, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice. This is what Jesus is drawing our attention to, what the unrighteous judge says to himself, not what he eventually does. We don't have that. He draws our attention to what the judge is saying to himself. His point here is this. How much better is God than this? How much bigger and better is God than what you see in this unrighteous judge? To those who are following the Lord, when they cry out to God day and night, he will not delay. That is, he will not be like this unrighteous judge and put his fingers in his ears and not want to hear these things. He will give justice to them speedily. Now, what does that mean? This is where it gets a little tricky, right? What exactly does speedily mean here? Because you and I have both been in in circumstances and situations in our life when we prayed and prayed and prayed, and it felt like God's answer was delayed much longer than we felt like it should have been. It felt like it wasn't happening nearly quickly enough. So what does it mean when it says speedily well a couple of things come to mind first of all we recognize that god is timeless god lives across all of time at the same time he just is there's not a was there's not a will be he just is all at one time across all of time because of that speedily may mean something altogether different from him than it does to us his timing is very different almost almost ungraspable on our part. Uh, His timing is so different from our timing because he doesn't live on a timeline the way you and I do. But secondly, Jesus does not seem to be addressing when we feel the effects of the judgment here. 
He doesn't seem to be talking about the effects of the judgment. He's talking about the, the decision to make the judgment, right? He does, he's not focused on, and then he made this judgment, and as a result of him making this judgment, there was an enforcement of this judgment, and finally the woman gets her judgment. He doesn't really get into all of that. Rather, when the judgment is made, his point is that God does not tarry, and that unlike their unrighteous judge, God's justice is already proclaimed. It is already a done deal. God's that God doesn't wait to do this. His justice is already proclaimed. But it may be further down our timeline before we actually see the consequences of that judgment take place. That's the reality here. Jesus' point seems to be that the more we pray, the more we begin to see God's justice already proclaimed, and the more we begin to understand His timing which is not the same as ours, in the administration of that justice. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement. Our persistent prayers for justice do not change God's plans for justice. Rather, they help us see His justice is already proclaimed. And prayer helps us begin to understand His perfect timing of it all. So Jesus ends this discussion then by returning to what he was talking about at the end of chapter 17, which is end times, when Christ returns. What's that going to be like? He ends this discussion by going back to that discussion. Look what he says in verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he's talking about himself here, when Jesus returns, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? It's a question that is just hanging in the air. His question seems to be aimed at the world generally, not at the church, not at believers, not at people who are following after him, but at the world generally. When Jesus comes back, what is the state of the world going to be? Will he find persistent faith such as what he's talking about in this parable? And the question almost implies a negative response. It almost implies this in, in everyone's head listening to this, yeah, probably not. That's not. This kind of persistent hopefulness is, is not indicative of the human condition. It's not really a part of this secular world that we live in. Uh, I love the way Eugene Peterson puts the question in uh, the message paraphrase of this same verse. He says, but how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on the earth when he returns? So he ties these two discussions together, the persistent faith and Jesus' return. The point here seems to be that this kind of persistent, hopeful praying and the faith that it represents is perhaps becoming less and less common in this world, not more and more common as we move through time. There's something counterintuitive about this teaching on persistent prayer and not losing heart when the world's prevailing winds are otherwise, right? The world's prevailing winds seem to be in the other direction, definitely blowing against it. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last statement on your listening guide. Standing in this world as a person of prayer and persistent faith is, in most cases, to stand against the prevailing winds of the world. For followers of Christ, this is the way. This is the way. So what have we said? What are our takeaways? Uh, summarizing, what have we said about pr uh, persistent prayer and justice? And what, what are we learning from this? Number one, we've said that our sense of justice, our sense of justice is embarrassingly small compared to God's sense of justice. We should bear that in mind. Number two, in matters of prayer, persistence and hope go hand in hand. Number three, we've said that God's justice is already proclaimed Prayer just helps us understand the timing of it all. And number four, we've said that being a person of persistent prayer is standing against the prevailing winds of this world. Those are at least some of my takeaways from this passage. I wonder what yours are. I am loving this study. I hope that you are as well. I hope that you guys have a blessed week. We will pick up right here where we've left off next week. Hope you'll come back for that. In the meantime, I love you guys, and we'll see you next time.